Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Good. And who is that, of course, for any of you who watch TV? I'm not the only one. The Verizon guy. You know that the Verizon guy has done the unthinkable and he has defected to Sprint. <laughs> making all these commercials for Sprint. But he's not fooling us. Well, that's the whole premise of it, of course, is that uh, Sprint was so good, or, and Verizon wasn't so good, I guess, that he made the leap. But, you know, he's not a new guy. He's the same guy, whoever he is. I don't know who he is. Um, Jonathan Zornan Platt, a professional commercial actor or something. But it's the same guy. There was no real change of who he was. He was just doing his thing for Sprint. Well, we're going to be talking about that a little bit today, and uh, this message really does fit into the idea of responding to Jesus. We've been running a series here uh, along those lines, and uh, I, I think this will be a, a good fit with what we've been uh, looking at uh, in messages over the past several weeks. Now, I will um, say, and I can say this, when you hit certain <coughs> ages, you can start saying things, and um, since 60 is uh, well behind me at this point, I, I was a child of the 60s, and I will not bore you with all those details, but, um, and no, I wasn't at Woodstock, although everybody was, of course, that I ever went into. Yeah, I was there. I was not. Not old enough to go, and um, I, was, I was in the most nerdy place you could be, Sharpton Hill Topper Marching Band. <laughs> that week. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I wear that as a bad distinction. Um, but a lot of us during that time were in a very serious business of finding ourselves. And, and we uh, were successful in some areas, in some areas maybe not so much. Um, and it wasn't simple many times, and it wasn't easy. And that's just, that is not to say that the 60s were the only decade in the history of the world where people were trying to find themselves. I mean, that's, it goes back quite a ways, and you know that. But um, often, uh, during that time, um, I, I did discover that we were often the ones in charge of it. And what we were trying to do was engineer our own transformation through all kinds of, of uh, different ways, some savory, some not so much, but they, um, we were in charge. And it wasn't until a little later that uh, when I, my beginnings as a, as a Christian believer uh, came about uh, with a group of people who are affectionately known, uh, it's historical now, because the early 70s, you know, the Jesus movement, Jesus freaks, Jesus people, and I was one of those guys, and yeah, the hair, and uh, no beard, but the hair, and, um, and I'm in touch with a, a number of those uh, people from that fellowship even today, and not a one has hair today. <laughs> Nothing there. So, um, but what I really loved about it was it was a situation where we weren't trying to, again, engineer that, that change ourselves. And God was most definitely at work there in ways that were uh, really amazing uh, at that time. And I'll always be thankful for that, even though the, uh, the main is uh, long gone, the battle has been lost, and I'm not going to throw it back. In, in this life. Maybe the Lord will bless me with it again later. But we're going to talk a little bit about the Apostle Paul today and what happened with him after that uh, very well-known incident on the way to Damascus and what happened uh, after that. Now, we know that Saul was his name before and Paul was his name after. And the name change in the Bible is really noteworthy. It's something to pay attention to. I don't understand all the ins and outs of that and how that would come about other than people's names were changed. It, it wasn't as simple because it was a very deep thing to go to the courthouse up on the square and apply for a name change. Okay, so if I decided I don't want to be Dave Lowe anymore, I want to be uh, Poindexter Lowe, and I go, to the, go up there and I guess I fill out paperwork and I'm sure pay a hefty fee uh, to become Poindexter Lowe. And then I get the paperwork and it's all good and I can change my ID and you can call me Dex, all right? Well, that's fairly straightforward to do, isn't it? I mean, it's paperwork.
work in, in, in a feed. So there we are. But it does, it's like the Verizon Sprint guy, I have to call him that now, Verizon slash Sprint, because uh, it really, that's a pretty, in its own way, a superficial name change. In the Bible, it was very, very deep. And that's what happened uh, with Paul. So at Damascus, to say the least, because you're, you're familiar with the account, you know, uh, it was a huge change for him. And we're, uh, we're going to look at some of those details. But God's intervention changed everything for the duration. Changed everything with him. And you might say, well, you know, if I were riding along on a camel or a horse or whatever, and I'm on my way to Menor, I'm going to the mall, I'm on Little Mount Road, I'm riding along, and I have an encounter with Jesus, and bam, there's all this light, and I can't see, and everybody else around me is all freaked out about it, and so forth. I, I, you know, I believe too. Would you? Go to the Old Testament. Look at how many incidents there were, these amazing, miraculous events that happened. And in many instances, the children of Israel, they believed after the fact, but then many, in time, found their way back somehow to Egypt, literally or figuratively. You know, so, yeah, I would certainly would get my attention you know, if I go out this afternoon and I have an encounter like that. Yeah, that's going to get my attention, no doubt about it. But there was more, obviously, that went on after, after the fact. Yeah, it blew all the way. It was one question uh, in, in Damascus. But there's, there's more to the story. So what happened was he had an identity change, or what is, can be called a paradigm shift, which just means that he was looking at everything in his life far differently than he had before. It was a very, very big deal. Now, for you theories of learning junkies out there, Theories of learning junkies out there. Sure. Yeah. Got one. <laughs> I didn't ask for a show of hands at 845, but okay, we've got one. Uh, Pastor Tom is officially a theories of learning junkie. Uh, we spent hours just talking about yeah. this stuff. And, and you know, adult learning theory has something called transformative learning. And that is something where now the, I, we don't want the children to run out of here because their time's come. You know. But what happens is there are two things that can happen. One is what's called a change in meaning uh, scheme. And that just means you're doing things differently than you had before. But it's, it's, it's a mental framework idea, your scheme. Change in meaning perspective means you're not only doing things differently, but you have a deep understanding of why you're doing them differently. Big difference, isn't there? And the meaning perspective part is the deeper of the two. I believe that in its own way, the board working with Paul, this is what happened to him. I believe this is what has happened, does happen, and will happen with us. There's no question in my mind about it. Now, Paul's background, he was from a place called Tarsus, which was not really near Jerusalem, it was northwest of Jerusalem, uh, a considerable distance, and he had a pedigree, and he puts that out there in his letters. He, he, Studied with the best people. He's a very learned man, very well disciplined. Hebrew of the Hebrews. He'd studied with a, a doctor of the law named Gamaliel. He turns up early in the book of Acts in, 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 in Jerusalem. So Paul very likely has his schooling in Jerusalem. Uh, he had a, that long list, as as was read, I think you read just a few minutes ago, of, of who he who he was. But there's more to it. He was very zealous or things of the law, etc. And yet his zeal was misdirected, wasn't it? It was misdirected, at least for a while, because he per persecuted the church of God violently. He tried to destroy it. He tells us that in, uh, in his letters. He went after believers. He had permission to do so. He was a rising star in the Pharisees' uh, society, the Pharisaical society, in that denomination, if you will. Uh, he he had arrangements to uh, take believers out of their homes, etc. Remember, he was the guy holding the, the coats of the ones who were stoning uh, Stephen to death in, in Acts 7. This was a guy you probably aren't going to be comfortable with sitting to, next to at the cookout. In somebody's backyard. Here's Saul. Oh, well, yeah. Saul. <coughs> okay. Better tread carefully. Well, that was him. He also described himself as rising, a rising star in Judaism, and he describes this as his former life in Judaism. And the Galatians certainly 
had heard about it when he wrote that letter, uh, heard about that part of his life. They knew about it. He described himself as a blasphemer or persecutor, an insolent opponent, the ESV says. And what is that? Well, insolent means defiant, stubborn, talking back to God in his own way. That's exactly what he was doing. Not a good situation. But Paul does again refer to it as his former life. This was him before. And he acknowledges that he lived it, but he does not take ownership of it. It is no longer his. It's, it's back there. It's on his resume, so to speak. But it is not running his life. He doesn't take ownership of it. And that doesn't mean that we avoid personal responsibility uh, for things we may have done before or where we were before, what we believed before. But we shift our sufficiency from all of that to the finished work of Christ, what God has accomplished for us in Christ Jesus. It's a matter of shifting our focus. So shortly after that incident on the road to Damascus, he wasn't just, you know, top dog ministering to the Gentiles in, in, uh, around him. That didn't happen right away. He was in Damascus for a while. He started preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ immediately and very convincingly, except that he had a reputation, didn't he? This change had happened with him, but he had a, he had a reputation. The Damascus believers were actually pretty protective of him. People would come to uh, Damascus to get him out of the way, and believers got him out of town and, and, and took care of him. And then he went to this place called Arabia. I have no idea where Arabia really is, and I think a lot of Bible commentators are not in agreement exactly where he went. Where did he go? Well, out there in the desert, something he went out there to do as Elijah had done at one point, something he went to Mount Sinai and was there for 40 days as Moses, as Moses had done. They might look at uh, the 40 days that Jesus was in the wilderness as a, as a parallel, but we really don't know very much about it. But I'm sure he was going to spiritual school during that time, whatever was going on. So I've got in my mind about that, that God was working with me. And this is on my list of I just got to know questions in the next life. I have, I have a list for you, you two. Um, of, um, well, what about this? So if I haven't seen Paul. He was a tent maker by trade. I don't know if he'll be building tents in the future, but um, uh, what will be going on. But, um, and I don't know what. My job description will be either, but hopefully we'll have a moment during a break. The whistle blows. Okay, wait a minute. All right. Paul, what were you doing in Arabia? What was up with that? Was it even Arabia? Where were you? We don't really know. We just know, though, that there was a period of separation. And he may have been with other people. Uh, at times. We don't know. So one theory is that he was uh, associated with a, a small Christian group out there somewhere. We don't know. But it was part of a process. He needed to just what was needed in his life at the time. So, then he comes back to Damascus. He's there for three years. Then he goes to Jerusalem. After all of that, then he goes to Jerusalem. And he wasn't there long, a couple of weeks. He met with Peter, and he met with uh, James, the Lord's brother. But there were people around who they knew about him, and some were afraid to even get close to him. They, or some didn't believe that he had, had really had this change in his life. All of these things took a little bit of time and took some process. So in our own lives, we don't need to get down on ourselves if things are happening immediately right away. Sometimes they do. Sometimes God accelerates things and uh, it's, it, it's really interesting how he works. But sometimes it's just a matter of hanging in there, staying put, and staying focused. Now in Colossians 1.27, Paul writes that it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. And this is our new identity. It's Christ in us. And when I say in us, I mean in us, in all of us, individually, and of course collectively as a body, but we're, it, Christ is in us. It can't be taken away from us. The awareness of it can, uh, or the practical application of it in our lives can. There's something in the book of Revelation called losing our first love. That can happen. That can happen to anyone. That's why we need to stay uh, diligent about it. Now, in reference to the last few messages, I have two Thomisms. I'm not starting a file or anything, but I, I don't want to put Tom on the spot here. I, I do have a file of uh, <clears throat> former band director at Chardon High School isms. I used to work in the band program. And, um, and he knows this file exists because the students would write things down during band and just hand them to me. 
Devin is an assistant director of it. And it, it's, 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 a, it's a hefty file after over a decade of working with them. Uh, my Thomism file is very thin, in fact, there isn't one. Uh, but there are two Thomisms. So I write things down, I'm sure you do too, and it gives me something to think about during the week and focus on. But there were two things Tom had mentioned in the last couple of messages that are really uh, germane to this. One is the unique nature of who we are in Christ. There's nothing else like it. The unique, unique nature. You can't get it anywhere else. You can't go to, it's not at the mall. You can't go to Walmart.com will not have it. Jet.com, Amazon.com, anybody.com, you can't order this online. UPS will not come to your house for a little box it says Christ in you on it, and you follow the instructions. We have the instructions right here. We already have it. The second time is this. Never let your identity be found in something that can be taken away from you. Remember that? Over here, a few weeks ago? That's the same thing. It can't be taken away. It can't be taken away. When you leave here today, you're not leaving Christ in you here. For those of you uh, with elementary age children, you have your cubbies, right? We don't have cubbies in teaching high school. Put your stuff in your backpack and get going. I don't have, I don't have cubbies in my room. Okay. Can I leave my stuff here? No. Take your stuff. Have 150 of you a day. Go. Get places to keep your things. But there's no cubby. You can't just, you don't have to leave it here in your, in your assigned cubby along the wall. And then next Sunday you come back and, oh, here's the Christ in me. I'm going to take that out. And check it out and get a little further. You don't have to do that. It's with you 24-7, all the time. And for me at least, that's very, very reassuring that, that Christ in us is in us all the time. But we have to go through a process. Paul went through it too, to bring out, to work out, to actualize, if you will, the Christ in him. And when you read through the epistles, the letters of Paul in the New Testament, he went through some things. Acts, the same thing. You read the book of Acts, you see more. He went through a lot of things. I don't know that I'll ever have to go through a lot of those uh, kinds of trials in my own life. Now, we all have trials. We all have things that we face. But he could not have withstood all of that if he did not have a very clear and focused understanding of who he was. I don't think he could have done it. I don't think it was possible. And the same applies to us. Clarity is very important. Now, I have a Higginism. <laughs> just one. Sorry, boy. I came out just one. And just for, to be fair, there was no paganism file. There ought to be with it. But uh, a couple of weeks ago, I don't recall which weeks it was, but um, that they were, but there, the, uh, the magic eye. Remember, uh, we talked a little bit about the magic eye. Now, I'll not go through the whole process again, and I don't have the full slide to put up there, so we can all test it out to, to see how it works. But if you remember what that was, how popular it was, it was in the newspaper every week, and Sunday comics usually, and you try it out, you sit there, and there were probably hundreds of thousands of people all over the country sitting, staring at a piece of paper on a, on a Sunday afternoon, uh, trying to find the image on the magic eye. Well, it's very simple. We know how, how it works. You need to follow directions, focus on it, and then eventually, out of all that stuff in, in the illustration, that image will make itself clear. Well, the key that I want to point out today is that the noise has to go away. It has to go somewhere. Do you get rid of it completely? Does it just go out the window of your home? No, it's still there on the page, but you're looking past it, and you are then that magic eye reveals itself, or the magic image or whatever, reveals itself. And that is very similar to what happens with us. We have something called social media today. Some of you may be connected with that, maybe some of you aren't. Um, I'm not passing judgment on it one way or the other, except that we know how powerful it can be, right? the principle of noise. Um, if you sit in any idle moment and you're, you're scrolling Facebook, you know, Granted, I'm, I'm very pro-Facebook for certain purposes, but when you start multiplying all of these different media, it can become pretty overwhelming, can't it? Uh, if you go onto your phone, this happens to me now, it's online all the time, and it just comes up on my screen, 20 different things I don't need to know, 
immediately. It's, it, I really don't need to know. Uh, I don't need to know what the president said five months ago on a tweet. I don't need to know that right now. I need to call somebody, or I need something. I need. I don't need that at the moment, et cetera, et cetera. Or which Kardashian was where, or what. I can't, I can't keep up with them. I don't know what anybody is. And I'm not saying it's wrong to, to, to look at it, just have those things in front of you at times. But it can really build up to something. It has a cumulative effect, does it not? And that's where the noise enters in, and that can interfere with our seeing clearly who we are uh, in Christ. We had a song, uh, Good, Good Father, that was sung a few minutes ago. I'm very thankful for the for uh, agreeing to do that. And, uh, and it does lock in with, well, who <coughs> our Father is, along with, and to be able to understand then who we are as Christians. The first recorded occurrence of noise in the Bible. We go back to Genesis chapter 3. There's your noise. Granted, it was primitive social media in the Garden of Eden. I thought that Adam and Eve were walking around with cell phones. <laughs> and besides, they were not wearing clothes and they were not ashamed. And where were they going to put the phone? You know, we, 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 we got nothing. Careful. But the principle was there, wasn't it? The noise was there. Social media was there. Did God really say that you couldn't eat of the, of all the, all the, did, did God really say this? Did God really mean this? Noise. Okay. Noise. Now, Jimmy had suggested to me at the end of the last service, well, there, there was still an apple around, wasn't there? You know? Uh, well, yeah, apple is in social media, computer. It took me a second to get it. That's, Walking out of there on adrenaline out after the service is over, and I'm, I'm processing. Uh, okay, out of here. Okay, I got it. A yeanism, beautiful. Good. But the principle was the same, wasn't it? It was enough to have some huge consequences. Would you agree? Yeah. And uh, besides, what cell phones? And, and I'll, I'll get off the whole topic of that. But um, who, who are they going to talk to? I mean, really. I mean, these, not a very long friends list at that point, probably for them to, to get into. But the principle, that's the important thing. It was still there. Absolutely, it was still there. So it says in Philippians 3, verse 12, that Christ Jesus, Paul said, has made me his own. He wasn't there yet. He was still in process. It's coming, that full arrival. But it, well, he wasn't there yet. We're not there yet, but we are in process. The main thing is that we stay on that, that path, that good path. Now, he talks about doing one thing in that passage, that, that, that Nicky read, that one passage, uh, that one thing to forget what was behind. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean you obliterate the whole thing from your memory? And you walk around with no awareness of, of your past? Um, no, the word forgetting in the Greek, and I'll not pronounce the word because it was a, a relatively new one to me, and I'm not going to try to do that. But it means to be neglectful of. It means to let something go that where you lose it out of mind. You don't not have it. It's, it's, it's not like it's not there. But it's just out of your mind. But not totally wrong. So, for example, you get some money. Do you think, oh, I'm going to take this $10 bill, I'm going to fold it, I'm going to put it in my wallet or my purse or whatever. And you go about your business and you forget about it and a couple of weeks later you're standing in Dunkin' Donuts. <coughs> or, uh, let, let's not do corporate endorsements here. A coffee shop. <laughs> and you want a latte and you don't have any, maybe you don't have any money and then you look at it, oh, here's the 10 bucks. Oh, I'm going to get a latte. I said blue latte earlier this morning, so I'll just, now I said it again. So it's out. That's dairy for me, isn't it? That's a blue latte, isn't it? I don't care where you go to get your lattes. The point is, the money was there. And you, you knew it, it was always there, but you didn't, you weren't thinking about it all the time. You were going on with your life and concentrating on the things you needed to, in spite of the fact that in the past somewhere, you had folded that $10 bill and stuck it in your wallet. Now, same thing with me. I have a daily, somewhat of a daily reminder of this. I was very ill when I was 25. Has some surgery done, and after going through that whole process, I have a scar right here. Now, I can't 
now that I said it was surgery, I can't tell you that I got it in you know, some brawl someplace. You should have seen the other guy, that's not going to work. And I, you know, didn't, didn't get it in, in the military or anything. I can't put that out there now because it was, it was surgery. But it's always there. But I don't study it every morning. I'm not in front of the mirror and, you know, counting the, where the stitches were and all of that. I don't do that. It's, it's, it's history. I've moved on to something else, okay, even though it is still there. So, very important. Now, the issue isn't whether God remembers our painful past, because when you're forgiven, you're forgiven. It's off the table. The issue is how we handle it, allowing this to have precedence over who we are in Christ. So Paul needed, and we need to be very deliberate, very focused, so as not to allow that. So I have three items for you to think about this week. Pick one, pick both. First, I would encourage you to read Philippians chapter 3 uh, sometime this week. Read it more than once if you want. And think about this in the sense of what was going on with Paul, but what was, what's going on with you? What's going on with you? How are you striving to not just by your own steam, under your own power, your own works, but it's expected that we stay put on this. And, and there's so much in that chapter, far beyond a, a one message. I mean, we could do a series on that chapter for quite a while, just in and of itself. Secondly, I ask you to reflect on how has Christ in you, Christ in you, changed your life or redefined who you are? And if you're new here today and you don't know what that really means, we can talk. We have people here who can share it with you more and assist you uh, along that line. But for those of you who've been here for a while uh, and have entered into this, how has this redefined your life? How are you different now than you were before? Can you, can you define that? Can you verbalize that? Because that leads us to our third point, which is Think testimony. All right, think testimony. Past, present, and future. It's kind of a new idea for me. I, I used to think of testimony as strictly a, pretty much a past phenomenon. Past, present, and future. In other words, what has God done for you in Christ Jesus? What has He done in your life? What changes can you document from Scripture that show you what He's made you to be in Christ? And there are well over 100 places in Paul's letters where that phrase, in Christ Jesus, in Christ, in the Lord, it's used uh, in some form. I have possession of that list, and if you want one at some time, let me know. We'll get it for you. Or you can look them up yourself. You can just do it online. Just find them. So there's so much there. Okay? So much there as far as the in Christ part. But then there's also the present. What's, what's going on right now? What's it looking like for you right now on this path? And then the future. What will we do? And it's not just you or me in the sense of individualism. It's, it's also, it's collective. It's, it's together as a, as a body of believers, isn't it? Uh, Lynn shared in the mission moment about people coming to others' aid and intervening in their lives on behalf of the Lord. Has that ever happened in your life? Have you been able to do that for someone else? So those three things, Philippians 3, reflect on Christ in you and how it may have redefined who you are, and I trust that it has, and thirdly, to think testimony, past, present, and future. Okay? Well, I'm certainly thankful for the privilege of being asked to share. Um, it, it's a real blessing to be able to do that, and um, I'm always thankful for everyone involved in the service and support that's there when uh, I'm asked to preach. So I love you, thank you for listening, and uh, let's just be in prayer for a moment together. Father, thank you for our being together today. Thank you for the Christ in us, the hope of the Lord, that we can be uh, all that we can be in Christ. That you've done so much for us, and that you've shown us how, in great detail, of how to stay on that path, enjoy those blessings, enjoy that transformation, and tell others about it as well. Uh, thank you for all these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh